Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name is Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in this morning. It's my pleasure to be here as always. And now we'll continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. Yesterday we ended with a discussion about Pope Pius IX's encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864 and how it's merely uh, reiterated those things taught by previous popes, condemning Bible societies, condemning freedom of conscience, condemning freedom of religion, condemning freedom of the press, and uh, simply stating in every, ter- in, in every way possible that only the Roman Catholic Church is relevant, only the Roman Catholic Church is the Church of Jesus Christ, and all other sects, as they call them, are heresy. Now, and I brought out a personal point that my Roman Catholic critic uh, says I make too much of Pope Pius IX's encyclical and syllabus of error since many Roman Catholics have repudiated it. They try to kind of sweep it under the rug and say, well, he overstated things and we don't believe that now and, you know, kind of spiting their own face and the infallibility of their Pope by dim- diminishing somewhat. But this author makes it clear that Pope Pius IX was only the last of a string of popes, infallible popes, who condemned all of our Protestant institutions, our Protestant way of life, our Protestant Constitution and Bill of Rights, and the very government of this country, a government of, by, and for the people, and that they would replace it, if it were possible, if it were in their, within their power to do so, they would replace our government with a papal government. Now, continuing where we left off, backing up uh, just a portion of a paragraph for continuity purposes this morning, we're going to talk about one of those preceding popes, and it says, uh, in this case, uh, actually, uh, Leo the Twelfth succeeded Pope Pius the Ninth. We dealt with previous popes earlier. It says Leo the Twelfth succeeded. Pius the Seventh, and Cormenin says, quote, "He was not long in raising himself to the highest dignity by means of his intrigues with the Roman courtesans and his liaisons with the bastards, that is, the illegitimate sons of the incestuous Pope Pius the uh, Sixth." Unquote. He promulgated the bull Quad Hoc Enuente Seculo, which fixed a universal jubilee for the year 1825 in order to, quote, revive the trade in dispensations, indulgences, benefices, and absolutions, unquote. And my comment at the end of the program yesterday was a so, somewhat of a chide at my Roman Catholic critic who says the Roman Catholic Church never sold absolutions. Here it is, Pope Leo the Twelfth, who succeeded Pope Pius the Seventh, did indeed sell dispensations, indulgences, benefices, and absolutions. And it says that which meets the special approbation of Pope the, Pius the Ninth in his encyclical is the attack of Pope Leo the Twelfth upon the philosophical and liberal schools, his charge that they rekindled from the, their ashes the dispersed phalanxes of errors, unquote, and his denunciation of them and their teachings in the following words. Quote, This sect, covered externally by the flattering appearance of piety and liberality, professes toleration, or rather indifference, and interferes not only with civil affairs, but even the even with those of religion, teaching that God has given entire freedom to every man so that each one can, without endangering his safety, embrace and and adopt the sect or opinion which suits his private judgment. 
This doctrine, though seducing and sensible in appearance, is profoundly absurd, and I cannot warn you too much against the impiety of these maniacs. Now, he says that these, this sect gives man a liberty, liberty of conscience to worship God as he pleases, and he condemns this as heresy. The papacy regards it as its sole jurisdiction to determine how man should worship God. And that's the problem that we have with the papacy and its relation to our government that acknowledges this freedom that every man possesses to worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience. One of the very basic institutions of this country is religious freedom freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, and the papacy calls it maniacal. Now, passing then to the quote-unquote deluge of pernicious books, here now we're going to talk about the freedom of the press, it says, passing then to the quote-unquote deluge, deluge of pernicious books which had obtained circulation, Pope Leo XII exhibits almost his uncompromising animosity to Bible societies, which he said were spreading, quote, audaciously over the whole earth, unquote, and to the publication of translations of the Bible in, quote, the languages of the world, which he declared was, quote, in contempt of the traditions of the Holy Fathers and in opposition to the celebrated decree of the Council of Trent, which prohibits the Holy Scriptures from being made common, unquote. The Council of Trent, one of the most circumspective councils of the Roman Catholic Church, declared with infallibility that it, it is prohibited that the Holy Scriptures should be translated into the language of the people and be made common. They used the pretext that it was belittling the Holy Scriptures, that they be reduced to the vulgar language of the people. So therefore, under that justification, they damned all Bible societies whose attempts were to put the Bible in the hands of every man, woman, and child so that they could read for themselves in their own language the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, continuing, he says, thus expressing the fear, yes, there's fear associated with this, the Bible is the papacy's worst enemy. It says, thus expressing the fear almost universal among the popes that the free circulation of the Bible would do the Roman Catholic Church more harm than all other causes combined, and he says this, quote, Several of our predecessors, that is, preceding popes, have made laws to turn aside this scourge, the scourge referring to Bible societies, and we also, in order to acquit ourselves of our pastoral duty, urge the shepherds, that is, the priests, to remove their flocks carefully from these mortal pasturages. In other words, these Bibles in, uh, translated into the common language. And he continues, he says, Let God arise. Let him repress, confound, annihilate this unbridled license of speaking, writing, and publishing. Unquote. Yes, let God arise and let him repress, confound, annihilate this unbridled license of speaking, writing, and publishing. That's freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and freedom of conscience. Let God repress it all, says the popes. Now, by this means alone, though the process is tedious and circuitous, do we reach the real meaning of the encyclical letter of Pope Pius IX? The initiated see it at once, that is, the Roman Catholic hierarchy, who are trained to read and understand these papal encyclicals. 
But to those who have neither the means nor the time of investigation, that's we the slaves, this ex explanation is necessary that we may more the readily realize wherein the papal principles thus enunciated are in conflict with the public sentiment of this country and with our social, religious, and political institutions. That's right. Pope Pius IX's encyclical attacked our social world, our religious world, and our political world. Okay? The new world order is a new social structure, a new religious structure, and a new political structure. A one-world government, a one-world religion, and a one-world social institution, a one-world uh, social uh, uh, we're gonna, no private property going to hold everything in common, everything for the common good. Okay, they're going to completely rewrite the social structure, the social laws of the world. Now, he continues, he says, nothing is plainer than that if these principles should prevail here, our institutions would necessarily fall. The two cannot exist together. They are open and directly antagonism antagonistic with the fundamental theory of our government and of all popular governments everywhere. The Constitution of the United States repudiates the idea of an established religion, yet the Pope tells us that this is in violation of God's law and that by that law the Roman Catholic religion should be made exclusive and the Roman Catholic Church acting alone through him should have sovereign authority quote, not only over individuals, but nations and peoples and sovereigns, unquote, so that the whole world may be brought under its dominion and be made to obey all the laws that he, that is the Pope, and his hierarchy shall choose to promulgate, and that this same church shall have power also to inflict whatever penalties he shall prescribe upon all those who dare to violate any of these laws. Now, I missed a note earlier when I was reading about Pope Leo XII. I want to retra uh, retrace just a little bit. Talking again about Pope Leo XII, he distinguished himself also by proposing to put in operation the system of... Now, this is directly... Uh, pertinent to the criticism of of my friend Charles, who says that the Pope never sold absolution. He says uh, Pope Pius, or excuse me, Pope Leo the Twelfth distinguished himself also by proposing to put in operation a system of quote taxes of the apostolic chancery for the redemption of crimes unquote. Now, what is that but absolution? And it says, and when remonstrated, when remonstrated by some of the cardinals on the ground that it would give just cause of complaint to the enemies of the papacy, that is, Protestants, he replied, now listen to this quote. Now, speaking directly to Charles, here's what he said. Bah, fear nothing. We will bring all the writers to reason. I act today with money for religion in order to act tomorrow for religion with money. That's Cormenin in his History of the Church, Volume 2, page 427. That's what Pope Leo XII said. He was going to use the money raised from, from absolution by charging taxes for the remission or the redemption of crimes committed by Roman Catholics. You say the Roman Catholic Church never sold absolution. It's recorded in history, and it's not denied by the papacy. As a matter of fact, Pope, Pope uh, J uh, Benedict XVI has revived the old system of simony in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, 
the Pope says that he should be the ultimate supreme authority in temporals. He should be the lawgiver of the world, and that anybody who violates the Pope's laws should be dealt with corporally, that is, corporal punishment, that is, be, to be executed if a death sentence is, is warranted. Now it says, the Constitution secures the right to every man of worshiping God according to the convictions of his own conscience. Yet the Pope calls this insanity and declares it to be the, quote, the pernicious, uh, most pernicious to the Catholic Church, unquote. The Constitution guarantees liberty of speech and of the press. Yet the Pope says that this is, quote, the liberty of perdition, unquote, and should not be tolerated. The Constitution of the United States provides for its own perpetuity by making its principles the supreme law of the land. Yet the Pope says that if he shall find, as he has already done, any of its provisions against the law of God as he interprets it, they do not acquire the force of right from the fact of its existence as the fundamental law of nations. In other words, just because this liberty exists in this country does not make it fact. Right? And it says, The Constitution requires that all the people and all the churches shall obey the laws of the United States. Yet the Pope anathematizes this provision because it requires the Roman Catholic Church to pay the same measure of obe obedience to the law that is paid by the Protestant churches, and claims that the government shall obey him in all religious affairs, and in all secular affairs which pertain to religion and the church, so that his will in all these matters shall become the law of the land. The Constitution of the United States subordinates all churches to the civil power, except in matters of faith and discipline. Yet the Pope declares this to be heresy, because God has commanded that the government of the United States and all other governments of the world should be subordinate to the Roman Catholic Church. The Constitution of the United States is based upon the principle that the people of the United States are the primary source of all civil power. Yet the Pope insists that this is heretical and unjust, because... God has ordained that all governments shall, quote, rest upon the foundation of the Catholic faith, unquote, with himself the Pope alone as the source and interpreter of the law. The Constitution of the United States repudiates all royal power, yet the Pope condemns this and proclaims that the world must be governed by the royal power in order that it may protect the Roman Catholic Church to the, exclu to the exclusion of all other churches. The Constitution of the United States allows the free circulation of the Bible and the right of private judgment in interpreting it. Yet the Pope denounces this and says that the Roman Catholic Church is the quote-unquote the only living authority, and I'll get back to that in a minute, that the Roman Catholic Church is the only quote-unquote living authority which has the right to interpret it, and that its interpretation shall be the only one allowed and should be protected by the civil law, while all others should be condemned and disallowed. That's right. The popes say... Notice, I, I use the plural form, the popes say that the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy, is the only living authority representing God. In other words, Jesus is dead. The papacy and the Roman Catholic Church is the only living authority which has the right to interpret the Scriptures. Jesus is dead, and so is the Holy Spirit. How could they justify saying that the Roman Catholic Church, under the Pope, is the only living authority with the right to interpret the Scriptures? 
if they are not directly asserting that Jesus is dead and, and Jesus needs a living representative on the earth to govern. That's the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. That Jesus is dead and all of those outside of the Roman Catholic Church, such as myself, we Protestants, are also dead. I'd like to claim that I am dead in Christ, but I am alive in Him as well. The papacy is the most arrogant, God-hating institution on the planet. How more could you express your hatred for God and for Christ than to say that he is dead and in need of a living replacement on this earth? One with the same power and prerogatives and attributes as God himself. No one but Satan himself would be that arrogant. And Satan is personified, given living form on the earth in the papacy itself. The papacy is the only one who has the right to interpret Scripture, and its, interpre and its interpretation should be the only one allowed and should be protected by the civil law while all others should be condemned and disallowed. So what does that do to Protestantism? My assertion is correct, that we're going to see an inquisition in this country the likes of which we can't even imagine. When the papacy decides to put down quote-unquote heresy in this country, as R.W. Thompson makes so plainly clear that it's going to happen, there's just, no, there's just no words to describe the carnage that's going to take place right here in this country. We, we all believe that the, uh, the Inquisition is over. It's now just become so big that nobody recognizes it for what it is. I'll just continue with the book. It says, In all these respects and upon each of these important and fundamental ideas of government, there is an irreconcilable difference between the Constitution of the United States and the papal principles announced by this encyclical letter. The two classes of principles cannot exist anywhere at the same time. Where one is, there it is impossible for the other to be. By this analysis of Pope Pius IX's encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864, we are enabled to sum up in a few words the meaning and purpose of this Pope. He would not only suppress all liberty of conscience, but would muzzle the press, suppress all Bible societies, prohibit the publication, distribution, and reading and possession of the Holy Scriptures translated into the vulgar tongue forbid the unbridled liberty of opinion and compel all the people to be obedient to princes and all princes obedient to him. He would exterminate Freemasonry. Now, continuing here where we left off before the break, R.W. Thompson is going to sum up what we've learned out of this encyclical letter of Pope Pius IX. And it's, he says, by this analysis of the encyclical, we are enabled to sum up in a few words the meaning and purpose of this pope. He would not only suppress all liberty of conscience, but would muzzle the press, suppress all Bible societies, prohibit the publication, distribution, reading, and possession of the Holy Scriptures translated into the common language. Forbid the unbridled liberty of, of, of opinion and compel all the people to be obedient to princes and all princes obedient to him. That's right. Just like the Dark Ages, right? That's what the New World Order is, a return to the Dark Ages. 
and it says he would exterminate Freemasonry by making corporal punishment the penalty of any association or fellowship with its members, and the and death the penalty of uniting with the order. He would repress, confound, annihilate, and uh, the unbridled license of speaking, writing, and publishing. And last, but by no means least, he would protect, encourage, and strengthen the corrupt society of the Jesuits with all their impious and immoral practices and principles as the sacred militia of the church, in order that by their aid, as vigorous and experienced rowers, the world would be carried back to the Middle Ages with himself as the independent and infallible sovereign of a grand, holy empire. That's it. They desire a grand, holy empire. Words synonymous with a new world order. Now, with this explanation of the encyclical, we're better prepared to comprehend the doctrines of the syllabus its sequel and logical consequence. Before proceeding, however, to analyze the most remarkable paper, it should, be con it should be observed that it was put forth by the Pope expressly as a judgment against all the progressive, read, read that, Protestant nations, against all existing civil and religious institutions not in compatibility with the papacy. This purpose, if denied, could not be concealed. But the Jesuits, whatever others may have done, neither sought nor deny, uh, nor deny nor conceal it. The Pope, under their guidance, under the guidance of the Jesuits, intended it as an arraignment of the whole non-Catholic world. To say that he meant to condemn Christian institutions would be, in this unqualified form, unjust to him. But it is precisely true to say that his immediate object was to condemn all institutions which he does not consider to be Christian. With him, that is, with Pope Pius IX, Roman Catholicism and Christianity mean the same thing. Institutions not Roman Catholic are not Christian, and all people who are not Roman Catholic are heretics. All these are aimed at in this official paper, this papal manifesto. At the time it was issued, Pope Pius IX was king of Rome, and if he had confined it to the papal states, merely to the denunciation of the means of his own subjects, when they where then were then employing to take from him his crown and temporal authority, it would have had far less significance than it now has. In other words, if this, this, this syllabus of error had been written to the rebels of the papal states that wanted to extricate themselves from under the boot heel of the papacy, it might have, it, it might have passed this papal encyclical. But it was not addressed to just the papal states. It was addressed to the whole non-Catholic world. And, and R.W. Thompson continues, he says, But witnessing, as he was compelled to do, the encroachments of the people upon the royal power all over Christendom, the gradual substitution of constitutional and representative government in place of the absolute monarchies which had so long held Europe in bondage, the general diffusion of liberal sentiments, such as favored the erection of popular governments, the growing intelligence of the masses. Seeing all this and finding his throne in a tottering condition, gradually moving from under him, he issued this pronunciamento from mere desperation as the only supposed means of preserving his imperialism. Did you hear what R.W. Thompson called this papal encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864 by Pope Pius IX? An act of desperation. And that's how we should view it. It was issued at a time of papal weakness, when the papal throne had been tottering on one leg. 
Victor Emmanuel and all the other Protest and all the Protestant nations of Europe had kicked the Pope out of their government and regarded him as the leader of the Roman Catholic Church and nothing more. Stripped him of his temporal power. The papacy was reduced to a blithering bag of bones. And at this time of weakness, when the old world order had been destroyed and Protestantism put up in its place and popular governments replacing the dictatorial decrees of the popes, this pope had the audacity to declare himself infallible and to condemn the whole Christian world because they followed the Protestant example. So, here we are today. The papacy regaining its strength. After once having toppled the papacy, now we find, and especially here in this once Protestant land, the papacy being propped up as the mouthpiece of God. It's just in comprehensible. Yes, he was found in his, he found his throne in a tottering condition, gradually moving from under him. He issued this pronunciamento from mere desperation as the only supposed means of preserving his imperialism. Inasmuch, therefore, as the syllabus was to be, uh, must be considered as attacking all progress and liberalism, everything which has tended to carry the nations away from the papacy, its censures were designed manifestly to fall most heavily upon those who had contributed to the greatest degree to this result upon the United States especially, for nowhere else have the principles it anathematizes been carried so far. As a Protestant people, we built our civil institutions upon the popular plan, because that is the most direct road to political and religious freedom, and because Protestantism and freedom are synonymous terms, especially in our national vocabulary. As a Roman Catholic prince, the Pope designed to strike directly at this plan, wheresoever it existed, understanding perfectly well that the divine right of kings to govern must be maintained, or the papacy would fall. We call ourselves a Christian people, and in doing so include both Protestants and Roman Catholics. We think we have a Christian government also, that is, a government which although the name of God does not appear in the Constitution, is based upon the essential principles of true Christianity and shelters, protects, and defends the worship of God in a manner acceptable to Him and according to the teachings of the Gospel. But the Pope concedes nothing of this. All the Christians have in this country, according to him, are Roman Catholics. All the Christians we have in this country, according to the Pope, are Roman Catholics. All else are heretics and infidels, and therefore not Christians at all. We are classed by the Pope and his hierarchy, along with the infidels, socialists, and communists of Europe. And because Protestantism, under the head of... <coughs> excuse me. And because Protestantism under the lead of Martin Luther and the other reformers of the 16th century, divided the Roman Catholic Church, and because the adversary, influence, uh, the adversary influences then excited are still at work, mostly from the effect of our example, and because whenever they lead to the establishment of a new form of government, the people become the source of all the civil laws, the syllabus was aimed as an ex exterminating blow at the Protestantism and government of the United States. Let me read that again. The syllabus of Pope Pius IX was aimed as an exterminating blow at the Protestantism 
and government of the United States. There's no escape for its advocates from this conclusion. It arraigns, tries, and pronounces judgment upon our institutions and commands the defenders of the papacy everywhere to unite in executing the judgment. It is consequently in plain but true words an insolent attempt of a foreign despot, the Pope, to excite among Roman Catholic part, the Roman Catholic part of our population sedition against the government in order that he, if success can thus be won, may become our royal master. It urges them, the, the, the indigent Roman Catholics of this country, by strong and irresistible implication, to plot together for the destruction of the great principles for which our fathers sacrificed so much and which we have prized more highly than our own lives. And it stimulates them to untiring activity in this work of demolition by announcing that all progress and liberalism must, as we boast of all recent civilization, it is said, is a curse of God and that heaven can be reached only by resistance to such impiety. It recognizes no form of Christianity but the Roman Catholic, no civilization but Roman Catholic civilization. Whatever does not lean upon the papacy for support is infidelity, atheism, or at best, materialism, which in order to serve God truly must be exterminated. It points out no source of authority but the royal and papal power and proposes to substitute this power for that of the people in the enactment of public laws. It denounces revolution and it's itself revolutionary, exciting rebellion against the just authority of the national constitution. It is a flagrant act of aggression, unparalleled, except in the the conduct of former popes. Such an, act can, uh, such an act as cannot pass unnoticed and unrebuked by the people of the United States unless they're ready to give up their freedom and to become slaves. Do you hear anybody denouncing the syllabus of error of Pope Pius, the ten, uh, Pope Pius the Ninth? Then one can only conclude that the people of the United States are willing to get up, give up their freedom to become slaves. And how is that manifesting itself? We're giving up our liberties for a promise of security. And where do you think that security is going to come from? Those who follow the Pope. You'll be secure so long as you give up your Protestant rights. But the moment you begin to clutch too tightly to your Protestant liberties, the Pope is going to use the civil power to squish you like a bug. That's where we're at in this country. Now, the syllabus is put forth under an imposing title, which must be taken as a key to its proper interpretation. Like the preamble to a law, it indicates the purpose of the law. It is called the syllabus of the principal errors of our time, which are stigmatized in the consistorial, the consistorial allocutions, encyclical, and other apostolic letters of our most holy father, Pope Pius IX. Quite a title, isn't it? You want to hear it again? <laughs> the syllabus of the principal of errors of our time which are stigmatized in the consistorial allocutions, encyclical, and other apostolic letters of our Most Holy Father, Pope Pius IX. Each proposition which it contains, therefore, is merely stated to be condemned, to show what a large portion of the principles now prevalent in the world are consistent to be errors, are considered, rather, to be errors, and the subjects of papal censure. It contains 80 propositions arranged in 10 sections, each section constituting a distinct class of error. That the reader may see what 
uh, that what has just been said is not undeservedly harsh, a few of its leading propositions will be stated with brief explanations of their meaning to aid him in the examination of the document for himself. Now, we're going to go through some of the most startling propositions of this encyclical. We're getting right into the meat of this encyclical. <clears throat> and I hope to get through some of this before the end of the program. This is really important. It says, under the head of indifferentism and latitudinarianism, Proposition 15 condemns the principle that every man is free to embrace and profess the religion he shall believe true, guided by the light of reason. He must know but little who does not know that this is a direct condemnation of the principle upon which our American constitutions are based. It makes all these constitutions heretical, and as all the supporters of the papacy consider it their bounden duty in the proper service of God to oppose heresy, it is a command to them that they shall oppose the American idea that a man has the right to worship God according to his own conscience, as it shall dictate. When this idea is destroyed, the Pope would have substituted for it the opposite one, that as we are not free to select our own religion or to consult our own consciences upon the subject, we must be compelled to take his, that is, to become Roman Catholics. For the absence of freedom implies necessarily that there is a power to command. As belonging to the same class, Proposition 18 condemns the principle that, quote, Protestantism is nothing more than another form of the same true religion in which it is, it is possible to be equally pleasing to God as in the Catholic Church, unquote. This denies that Protestantism has any Christian faith. Hence, it is the duty of all Roman Catholics to destroy it, which in this country can only be done by destroying our Protestant institutions. Under the class of errors entitled, Errors Concerning the Church and Her Rights, Proposition 20 condemns the principle that, quote, the ecclesiastical power must not exercise its authority without the permission and assent of the civil government. This denies the authority of the government of the United States or of any state in the Union to make laws governing everybody alike, both clergy and laymen. It asserts that the ecclesiastical power, that is the clergy, that is the Pope and his clergy, has the right to do what and as it pleases without the permission or assent of the state, that it shall be independent of the state and above all the laws which the state may enact for the government of its citizens. It favors the erection of a privileged class, superior to all other classes, and therefore having the right to govern them all. Proposition 23 in the same class denies the Roman Pontiff and the Ecumenical Council have exceeded the limits of their power, have usurped the rights of princes, and have even committed errors in defining matters of faith and morals. This justifies and endorses all that any of the popes have done in reference to dethroning kings, releasing their subjects from their allegiance, and bestowing heretical governments upon Roman Catholic princes. It claims also that all the popes from the very beginning have been infallible in defining faith and morals. Proposition 24 of the same class condemns those who assert that the church has not the power availing, of her, uh, availing herself of force or any direct or indirect temporal power. This necessarily affirms the, opposition, uh, the opposite of the condemned error and means that the Roman Catholic Church and himself as the sovereign head of the church has the authority to employ force and the temporal power to compel obedience to its decrees. All right. 
That's the theory that was behind the entire Inquisition of the Dark Ages. That the Pope not only has temporal power, but he can command the civil authorities to carry out the, the pronunciations of the priests upon the people and put them to death for heresy. The papacy is trying to restore that old world order. That's what the new world order is. Proposition 30 of the same class <clears throat> condemns those who say that the immunity of the church and the ecclesiastical persons derives its origin from civil law. Here it is distinctly claimed that the Roman Catholic clergy, wherever they may be, possess immunity above the law, which elevates them into a privileged and exclusive class above all other citizens, made superior to all others, and therefore renders it a positive duty that all others shall obey them. Isn't that what we're seeing today in this, in, this, uh, in this world today? All the pedophile priests are shuffled off to other dioceses, other archdioceses, or even to other countries. And if they continue to molest little boys, eventually they're taken up at Rome. Not subject to the civil power. The Roman Catholic Church says they're above the civil law and that these matters are matters for the papacy. They're, they're subject to divine principles. And the Pope, as the divine head of the Roman Catholic Church, can deal with those matters as he sees fit. This is put into practice. It's visible before our very eyes how this system of the papacy works to protect its criminal priests. They're untouchable by the civil law, except by the permission of the Pope. And when you see a Roman Catholic, church, uh, Roman Catholic priest prosecuted and condemned to prison in this country, it was only from the assent of the Pope. We'll continue with these propositions tomorrow on the Inquisition Update.